special. <laughs> Very good to meet you. It's um, it's, it's great that you identify yourself with with a value with with such a beautiful value, right? You know, it's not just how I appear. It was this name was given to me at the customs by the customs agent in Toronto, flying in the second time when he saw my passport. And he looked at my me and the pastor. He said, "Are you happy, Herschel?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Where does it say happy Herschel on my screen?" It says, "You're happy, Herschel." I told this story to someone who was um, at a counter in Jerusalem making my boys yarmulkes. I call it yarmulke head covering. Mm -hmm. And the guy behind the counter heard the story and said, "You need a, a, a yarmulke that says Happy Herschel." I said, sure. Mm -hmm. So the first version had Happy Herschel in the front. The second version has it in the front and the back. I'm happy coming and going. It's such a story. One of my clients made a happyherschel.com website. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, so when I meet someone on the street, they say, who are you? I say, I say I'm Jane. Oh, I, I ask me who I am. I'm Happy Herschel. And you're happy who? Mm -hmm. Everyone responds. Why? We're all wired to be happy. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. We're all pre-wired to be happy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, the thing is, you see, that that story is so um, linked with your identity. You identify with being happy. You value happiness. You know, you've just said that we're all wired to be happy. So and it the behavior, you know, so your behavior derives from that. You know, you you behave in a manner that is very jovial, very, very cheerful. Whereas if you didn't think happiness was so important, you may not be as jovial as you you express yourself to be. That's a good point. And there's a there's a level that's even higher than happiness. Joy. Mm -hmm. Joy. Because happy, happiness comes from hap, which means happenstance. I can be or cannot be. But true joy is always, is perennial. Keep that in mind. And when it comes to healing, if joy heals, because joy opens up all the inner blocks and boundaries, and love, it's nice, but it doesn't heal. This is an aside. At what point in your life did you identify with being a healer? It happened in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. My wife, who is a homeopath and physical therapist, uh, and she taught energy medicine, took me to all kinds of conferences. And one day, she took me to a conference uh, on, on healing. At the end of the conference, a woman took a picture of my aura. And she said, I never saw anyone whose entire being was healing. And she had a readout, you're, you have positive, you're very powerful thoughts, you're a good teacher. I teach you know, occasionally in groups, large groups. And then my wife in, was booked in, to see people in, in, in near uh, Montreal. And she was so overbooked, I started helping her. Only because Lady said, your entire being is healing energy. I started a process and continued it. Within two years, I was full-time. Mm -hmm. Right. That's how I started. Literally, that's how I started. Yeah. And the, the power of somebody telling you something like that, which kind of shifts the story, perhaps, of who you thought you were before they said that. You know, maybe... Um, sometimes it takes an outsider to to remind us of something, to remind us of, of a value that we hold dearly. And, and I suppose that's the power of stories um, per se, because we we see ourselves reflected in the other person's story. or We see ourselves reflected when so that person who made that comment, you must have resonated with it for for you to value that comment otherwise it might have just been another comment that you know people say things a hundred percent you see it's with a comment attached with an amazing divine providence had my wife not been on her journey to help a lot of people you know in a place outside of uh montreal called touch and she wasn't overbooked and needed extra help i stood up and started helping because i just took a class on healing with thought and my main modality, I actually call therapeutic thought for in my healing process. Mm -hmm. yeah. so a lot that came together is a confluence of events. 
And once I started, I said, this is the real me. Right. Okay. The real me. That in itself is a very powerful statement. This is the real me. It's like, it's as though when, we, when we're uh, able to um, confidently say, this is the real me, that's like becoming the protagonist in our own story, isn't it? Rather than being someone who's been given a role that is not, um, it's not a role that we've chosen to say, this is, this is who I am. It's, um, it's, it's that confidence in uh, knowing the truth of who we are, and that becomes a more authentic story, rather than something which is like we were maybe experimenting with, toying with. Life is a story. Mm -hmm. And we need to identify who we are in the story of life. From the day we are born, we walk along a path that brings us more and more to our ultimate state of authenticity, being the real you, the actualized you, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a paradigm that I learned in a story years ago around um, Abraham, who was given a, um, a directive by God. And the directive in Hebrew only makes sense, and I'll translate, it's lech lecha, means go. He's supposed to go to Haran and, and start a nation. However, the double language, lech lecha, really means esoterically, what do you, does one have to do to become the real you, authentic? There's a paradigm. It means leaving your land, leaving your birthplace, leaving the house of your father, and going to where I'll show you, which has no address. It's a process. The process starts with raising your consciousness. We all want to have raised consciousness, right? Leaving your, your place of birth. We're all given a certain nature, good or the opposite. We can change our nature. How powerful is that? And more importantly, is leave the house of your father, which in this context means leave all the things that happened to you. Mom did this, dad did this. Whatever the occurrences were, the land you go to is your perfected state of being. However, most importantly, don't look back and don't make excuses. How many people look back at our past and make excuses of what happened? It happened for a reason. Once you realize nothing happens by happenstance, it's all by divine providence. And I had it happen to my soul within my body. We process it differently. And that is how we become authentic. So you know what my real title is and help people become authentic? I'm a uologist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Zoologist. No, uologist, uologist. Uh -huh. Okay, can you explain that to me? Because I know zoologist, but not uologist. No, okay, I just made it up. It's a theologist, uh, it's a theologist okay. of that you, being authentic. You have geologists, psychologists, zoologists, oh. all kinds of ologists, but the real one is the youologist bringing the real you to the surface. When the real you surfaces, you get a new form of action. You attract beauty to your life. You attract friends and friendships and lovers to your life. You attract more livelihood to your life being the real authentic you. Yeah. It's interesting that you you tell that story from the Bible. And if I were listening to that story, it would encourage me to travel. It would encourage me to, um, you know, find uh, places where I can thrive and to flourish. Whereas I may hear a very different alternative version of like the life story and origin and, and where we're going. And I might not feel that it's a good idea to travel. It might feel that it's much better to stay where we are and that the treasure, you know, the treasure of life basically is right under our feet. So the two different stories would, would encourage people to behave in very different ways. And so there are some people who will fight to the death for their land because for them, life is about remaining you know being loyal to the land and and being um 
you know that that is the the pathway to um our success is to be able to hold on to what what is ours whereas for somebody else the story could be like well mm -hmm. leaving your land and finding other pastures new where you might be able to thrive right. Which better. Right. so two different we're all we're all territorial beings right we all stake out some part of land whether it's a, it's the the four cubits in front of you or your your city or the world or there's some people you know their territory is the globe you know that's what hegemony is all about the people want to conquer the world right remember the old saying when when khrushchev was at the UN, he would take his shoe off and he would, he would hit the table and, and he would say, uh, mir, right? In, in Russian it means I want peace, but mir also means I want the world. Mir means the world. <laughs> I want the world. <laughs> he was not missing words, right? Yeah. So there is that um, issue as well that um, I want the world. And, you know, maybe that's the thing about ambition and success because it's never ending it's like you know we we want to go to other planets now we want to conquer other galaxies now so right our, our life on earth doesn't seem to be um you know there, there's there are bigger dreams there are people are uh, creating stories about life on you know building their life um staking their claim on other on other planets basically right so, right so the story is not just about the globe is it it's it's much bigger than that right again as i said life's a story where do you find yourself so when you find yourself where does our story begin in our dna mm -hmm. our story begins in our dna because that's the book of life it's a story book of life if i may be creative no pun intended, to add that to uh, to the book. So when we look at ourselves as I'm a function of my DNA, well, that's in all of my genes. So we know from um, epigenetics, you change your environment, you'll change your genes. So what is the most awesome tool we have in changing our genes from the inside out by what you think. If you think good, it'll be good. That will change your genes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so in our genes, we still carry the stories of the previous generations. We That's right. That's right. Yes. And for many of us, we don't know what these stories are. I don't know how fortunate you have been in, in knowing your family history, but some people, they don't have an education about their own family history. You know, uh, someone like myself, I was brought up in Britain, but I, I'm not from Britain, I'm from the Punjab. And so all of my education was not about history that is relevant to me. Um, right. Yourself, um, have you, do you know your, I imagine that you know your family history, because I think that's, that can be yeah. very, yeah. Yeah, we all go back, you know, everyone started with Adam and Eve, you know, and then the Jewish nation started with Abraham and Sarah. That's our history. We have a spiritual history and, and the world at large started with, with Noah, right? After the flood. So, and Noah was a righteous Gentile. When everyone views themselves as being righteous, you know, uh, versus, you know, is, is there depravity, is not depravity? I would like not to think that I was born uh, innately evil or, or inveterately bad and to say that I've got the potential for greatness as being a good person because the universe was created with the, with the, with the uh, trait of goodness. Everything comes from goodness. We can't see it all because there are veils from one room to the next. We can't see the veil. So once you realize where you're coming from, let's say a person has a genealogy that may be a little slurred or a little murky for whatever reason. Am I my genealogy? Right? How do we go beyond? Well, we have to have, we change ourselves and get designer genes, right? We can change ourselves and, and change the genealogy. You change your genes, you change your genealogy. 
But other than mincing words, you know, or, or, or you are using unnecessary hyperbole, what can we do to view our past in a positive way that everyone can bank on? It's in order, once you know who you are, then you can become what you're meant to be. Got it? And so, am I my environment? Am I my genes? How do I go beyond the pale of misunderstanding? How do I get out of the ghetto of my genealogical misfortune? How does one get out of the ghetto of one's genealogical misfortune? Wow. And how do you reconcile your story and based on your own lived experience, how do you reconcile that with other people's stories who don't follow that same tradition? They don't, they don't have, they haven't been brought up with those same stories. They have a very, they have an alternative vision basically of um, our origin as a species and where we're going, you know? So how do you reconcile the, your story and others, stories that are, that have um, an alternative view to yours? May I have a little flexibility and change, reconcile with accommodate. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. okay with that? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's, it's, for me, it's about weaving a tapestry, you know, it's like synthesizing. So whatever word we use, it's about like, you know, here's one story, like here's a powerful story. A lot of people believe this story and a lot of pe people believe another version of events, which contradict one story, you know, how do- Right, exactly. How can, okay, are there indeed contradictions? So, so you can have, there are a couple possibilities. You can have, two contradictions being reconciled. And that's called the, the, the realization of a paradox, right? You know, you have, it's a paradox on some level. And how we go beyond the paradox. So let's view it like this, that we have, there are many stories out there. You know, we look at a book, you have fiction and nonfiction. Is your story a fiction or a nonfictional story? <laughs> you know, yeah, be honest, where is it coming from? And then who is the arbitrator, the arbiter to say, this is fiction, this is nonfiction. So this is where facts come in. When you take out, without this, when the two stories don't jive, you have what's called conflict. Mm -hmm. How to resolve conflict. Make sense, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So when you talk to people and want to have a cogent discussion, about even heated or maybe not 90 topics. Take out the emotion and let's look at the fact. Let's, you know, they say, just the facts, ma'am, the, only, the, only the facts, you know? Let's look at the facts. And then we have to determine whose facts are real. <laughs> Who, like you look at the world right now. I don't think we're going to go into this. And there, there are two different stories from science about the virus hurts, the virus doesn't hurt. Does it kill, does it not kill? You know, like we, we, we we're living in, in a, in a pre-psychotic state and we're living a, a life of a conundrum. Mm -hmm. How does one science come up with two diametric opinions? Look at our world right now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's, you know, you have- And you when know, we think about facts, that's when there is conflict because it's like, then people start to, um, you know, lock, lock horns because they right. say, no, this fact is true. No, that fact is true. Whereas when it's a story, it's like, well, yeah, those are the stories that you have been brought up with. These are the stories that I've been brought up with. When we call it a story, there is a more, you know, a scope for collaboration because it's like, well, they are stories. Let's look at the similarities. Ah, uh, you said it right. Some people confuse collaboration with clobbering the other guy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> if you don't believe in me, we'll clobber you, right? And it's, a, it's that when your cognitive dissonance uh, imposes upon my free will and safety, then you got conflict. <laughs> yes, that's right. And so this, you know, what you've talked about is a great example of like science will, well, you know, 
these are the scientific facts from one point of view and these are the scientific facts from another point of view and it's like and we're we're at we're confused because we've got all these different facts and we've got fake news and real news and it's like well who is um who is the the judge of like what is absolute truth yeah i tell people will the real gravity please stand up mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. or people have confusion about their own uh sexual identity mm -hmm. and and so i like to uh pose it under this chromosomes don't lie check your chromosomes for the truth mm -hmm. okay so so yes it's the chromosomes it's the dna and and i suppose when we start to manipulate our chromosomes you know and and there is that work being done in the name right of right so right there is manipulation so it's again that creates a new story then doesn't it it creates a new yeah. story the the story of like well um if we um if we are masters of our own stories if we if we have the right to um try and modify our genes and you know like where where are the limits for that it's a good point so a thought just came to me and it's this stories there are stories and there are narratives stories have a purpose narratives have an agenda mm -hmm. right all kinds of narratives and you see that they're conflict narratives and 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 so when all else fails, my mother had a great saying, and it's never failed me yet. When all else fails, use your common sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And the thing is that common sense is, I think it was a um, philosopher from Italy. I think it was Gramsci. Yes, it was Antonio Gramsci, who said that there is a difference between common sense and good sense. And common sense is that which you know, like the masses believe. It's like it's it's common sense. Whereas for some other people, that can be just um, you know, like uh, an old wives' tale, for example. But it's seen to be common sense. But good sense is when we are conscious that we're making, um, you know, we're 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 aspiring for goodness, truth, and beauty, basically. You know, so that's the philosophical aspect of it. And not all common sense is good sense. Yeah, because common sense has now become uncommon. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, um, a, I think an Italian historian, this came out in the news, popularized by a Swedish psychiatrist, and he wrote a book on stupidity. And you look what's happening now in our world, that all five categories of stupidity are, are present. <laughs> you know, people do, how do people that are bright do stupid things, right? Lacking common sense. Where I grew up in the Midwest, in America, there was an overabundance of common sense, you know? And it's from Mark Twain territory, Samuel Clemens. And, um, and, you can be very bright and and do things that are just beyond sensical or even grotesque. You know how do brilliant people, bright people, do things that harm humanity? You know we're we're in a stage now where we need to use our common stories for a common good and leave our narratives. When you go to a higher realm in life and, 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 and look at the spiritual, the spiritual can be good or could not could be good. Depends what you call spiritual. When you go into the realms of the holy, the holy is only good because it descends from a godly source. And we use God as the arbiter. Whoa, now we're talking. Or as mother would say, now you're cooking with gas, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So if, when God is the arbiter, then we have a sense of absolute truth. 
people would argue, like our friend, you know, go back to another Italian, I think it was Spinoza also Italian. You know, is, is, there, is there an absolute truth? There's not absolute truth. I don't know. Well, I do know there is. It's from God, you know, and God gave us a revelation and look in the Torah, you'll see that um, when you come from a perspective, I want peace. I want show means peace, right? When you come from a, a um, mindset that engenders peace, then you have different outcomes. What will engender peace? Is my story a peaceful story or is the one mind the opposite? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So when you go into battle, I tell my I tell my clients, you want to be a a happy warrior. What do you call a happy warrior? A gladiator. <laughs> yeah. It's just that not everyone wants to be a gladiator. Right. Sometimes you're you're impressed into the army against your will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to rise to the occasion, and we have to, you know, we, we, when you when you encounter a, a number of people and they surround you, it's either put up or shut up. You know, it's it's like the time to defend yourself. So what do you do? So we have an axiom that we're never put into a position that we can't handle. On some level, we can handle it, and that's how we um, we rise to an occasion by bringing out that force in us that's nascently or latently waiting that moment under unbelievable pressure to expose itself and help either physically or mentally. You know, that's why they say that um, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And that's what creativity is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have been in the, uh, you've positioned yourself in your advancement of creativity and human potential for, for decades now. So, yes. so you've obviously been researching and exploring and experimenting with things that work. What, what do you think we still need to know about creativity and stories that we don't know? Okay, let me, with your permission, you can you know, edit out if you want, that came to me this morning about a new way of looking at creativity. Well, this morning, I even put on my notes your name. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I put your note, your name, your name to remind me that's for you. Mm -hmm. So this is my gift to you. So creativity is that seminal spark of inspiration that we develop, apply, and apply in a way that benefits mankind. Wow. Mm -hmm. So... I look at things esoterically in terms of where does that seminal thought come from? That's wisdom. There's a divine channel of a wisdom and we can all connect to it. That's the meaning of that spark, that flash. Mm -hmm. That's wisdom, chachma, chachma, the power of what is. And it has a source called the chachma skill, the power of enlightenment. And that's why thoughts are always moving. When you have the intent of creating something, something that wasn't there, something that is here, right? A new thought, the birth of a thought. So when you have a birth, when you say mazel tov, right? <laughs> you have a birth of a new thought, right? Mazel tov, a new thought, right? Yeah. And so when you have the intent, but however, let's go up a, a notch. Every energy follows intent. So mm -hmm. when you intend to create something that will benefit mankind, you can't imagine what's coming in. But then again, what kind of receptor are you, right? Someone, I'm also a master baker, a master chef. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I came to New York, I started the first 100% organic challah company, commercial, serving holy challahs, bread, mm -hmm. all throughout New York in 1980. It was Jacob's Table Challah. My, my label said, from my table to yours, the hollow that rises to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about how to make a better hollow. And then when I went to catering, I thought of how to make a better poached salmon or a better chicken wellington, right? Mm -hmm. And so a, a potterer is not going to think about making a, a better pathway for neurological development, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. And so 
you think about that which you are involved in. And so when I started my research in creativity, the spark was depression in America and how it impacted our gross national product. I asked, what can I do to correct that? I was looking for a, a means of correcting depression. And I said, the, you know what they say, what's the, what's the best medicine for depression? A big check. <laughs> right. You know, and so um, I interviewed all kinds of people and I came out with this, this uh, like a lead motif, you know, of, of commonality. And, and that is, we have that which you're striving that's meaningful. I'm living for something meaningful. It gives you a new sense of gratitude, an awakening of inner powers that aren't necessarily extant without that sense of life has meaning. I'm here for a purpose. How do I advance that purpose and maintain my cool and, and, and sanity? How does one maintain sanity in a frenetic world? It seems as though you followed a very scientific method there. You made an observation and then you formulated a theory about what you observed and you experimented, you, you, you interviewed, you consulted, and then you drew conclusions and then perhaps made predictions, you know, based on the, the conclusions that you drew. And that is a story in itself. The, but science and stories, you know, as we said earlier, science seems to focus more on the facts and the logic, whereas the story focuses more perhaps on the meaning and the interpretations. How did you match the two? How did you marry these two? Uh, Perfect. I call it so soul mm -hmm. bridging science. There's a, everything has a soul. We, everything that exists has a soul. Call that our spiritual side, and even emotional side. And then the facts are the facts on the ground in terms of the givens of existence, right? And all the equations, even in, 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 um, in quantum mechanics, we don't know why the equations work, but they always do work, right? Because everything that lives, there's a body and a soul, right? So we have the, 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 the soul, is our ultimate story. The body is the physical, that's the given. The two have to come together, right? I've never seen a body without a soul except a corpse. Yeah. And I you know? it's a little bit like what facts are. You know, a fact in isolation without its context is like that corpse. It doesn't have Good. a soul. That's a, that's, a, that's a great point. Write that down. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> You're pretty creative yourself on the, on the fly. <laughs> Thank goodness. So uh, you could have been a student of mine. Any, or I could mess into yours. Uh, maybe we're in a past life. Who knows? You know? <laughs> we're coming together now for a reason, right? Yes. So it's the power of conversation, isn't it? The power of conversation is that we enter that territory of the unknown because we don't know what you, I, you don't know what I know and I don't know what you know. And through conversation with building that bridge, we, we raise our awareness and the, and the ideas come from that nexus point that may well, not have. Exactly, been. exactly. Actually, when two people communicate, you know, um, there, there are four levels in creation. We have the inanimate, vegetative animal, and man. Man in Hebrew is called medabrim, those who speak, right? And so when you speak, speak is malchus, is, 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 is sovereignty, but also it's, 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 it's it, uh, malchus, sovereignty is, is refers to speech. And when you speak, we bring out the best in the other and we create a new identity called a creatively inspired new thought or concept that we bring out of both of us. It happens only with conversation. Now, does it, does it work if you have a, a monologue with yourself? You know, or I, I tell people, listen 
to your neshama is called your soul. When you listen to the message of your soul, what's that called? S O U L. It's called a soul liloquy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Listen to that and see what you come up with. You know, follow that path. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Herschel, I could carry on talking to you for hours, and I'm sure we would, you know, lots, lots more ideas would emerge, but let's leave that for our next conversation. My pleasure. Thank you for Thank having you. me here. Thank you. And may everyone enjoy this in a beautiful way and go on, inspire someone else, make someone else's day, make someone laugh and give someone a present. Just do something for someone you wouldn't have done to make their day, mm. do a kindness, and that will help the entire world. Absolutely, because they, they do say that it's um, how people make us feel. We remember that forever, don't we? You know, we might not remember what they've said to us, but we will always remember how they made us feel. And we're, and we're not the subjects of other people's thoughts or feelings. We can experience something, recharacterize it, turn it around, and grow from there. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye for now. All the best. Thank you.